the story so far. I am attempting to port Alan Cox's Fusix operating system to the ESP8266. Last time I, in a long, rather boring video, managed to get the build system and all the source code actually compiling, so I do now have a binary that I can flash and run on the device, which I shall demonstrate. Oops, that's get that on the screen uh, and run the serial terminal and hit the reset button and it starts and immediately hangs. There is some obvious stuff wrong but since the last video was basically me adding stuff to a make file this one is where we actually start problem solving. Okay so the first thing that comes up is I spent some time last time where is it uh, getting the interrupt system for this processor working being able to turn interrupts on and off this is as we say in the trade all complete bollocks uh, I found out that this is not how you do it at all uh, over here I have the Arduino source code for the ESP8266, which is really useful as a reference. And it turns out that this CPU actually has an instruction to do exactly what I want. To, in fact. So all we need to do is to turn interrupts on, use the rsyl instruction, like this. This will set the interrupt status to zero, meaning no interrupts masked, and return the old status in A2. To disable them, we do rsyl A2,15. And this will return the old status in A2, which will then be passed back to the system. To restore a previously saved interrupt state, we do... Uh, like this. So what you do is you call hard di, this returns the old interrupt status to turn them back to what they were before you call irq restore, pass in the value in a2 and uh, it will set the interrupt status to that. I'm going to add some comments. So uh, this system uses a different comment character. OK, so let's try burning that and seeing what happens. See if anything's any different. Yep, uh, it is actually now better. Uh, it's. Interesting that we get a different result this time. So what this probably means is that it is actually, hang on a second, that's a flash address. Uh, 2136 FA. This is trying to set up. This is trying to set up a process. I'm not sure it should be doing that at this point. Also, I'm a little surprised by the fact that immediately after burning, we got the reboot panic, uh, which actually needs some work. 
That will be in main.c, where is where is panic? Oh, panic's a panic is uh, is a core function it's in process.c. What it does is the kernel has detected an error, therefore it halts. Here we go. Right. Uh, the reason why we were getting that infinite loop is it's tried to call platform monitor to return to the monitor, which calls platform reboot, which calls panic. So what we're going to do is just replace this with... Oh, actually, we don't need to. It's going to do that anyway. This becomes a no-op. And this can actually be the same. Okay. So what's this going to do? Okay. This... So it is trying to... Yeah, it's about the same address. It's trying to create a process. Let's add some tracing and see where it's going. So we will start to see. So Fuzix main is the startup code. And it prints the banner, which we are seeing. It does some stuff, it does some more stuff. I don't recall seeing this message, but let's try that again, shall we? Okay, it's printed dev boot, but nothing else. So where does dev boot happen? Device in it? Oh, no, it's, it's up here in the... It's up here. Okay, let's stick some tracing in. This is a useful trick with C. Uh, underscore, underscore, line returns the current line number, so we can just go through like that. And we hit the reset button, prepare to pause this trace. And what's that done? 391. Okay. Right. Uh, so that has failed at create init, which is creating the, the init process. Oh, it is in start.c. So this will mean that part of our process setup isn't working, which is really, no one is going to be surprised at that. So the way Fuzix and old fashioned Unixes work is there is no kernel process or kernel stack after system startup. When the system boots, it sets up all the hardware, then it creates a init process and hands control over to that process, which is happening here. And then none of this code is used anymore. So what create init is doing is it's setting up that first process. Uh, this is loaded off disk. It's in fact the init binary. You can see here it's setting up the command line. Um, so we can put our tracing in. This will no doubt be because 
uh, our UData stuff isn't set up correctly. Yeah, make proc has failed. Which is in process.c. Okay, all right, here is uh, a line where it's actually turning interrupts off and returning the old interrupt state. So down the bottom it calls IRQ restore to put them back in again. So let's stick some tracing in. And in fact, that'll just tell us what the various process pointers are to make sure they look reasonable. And reset to pause. Right, now, that doesn't look right. If we look at our memory map, we can see that all the user data lives at 3FFE8000. And the way our process is going to be laid out is the user data block, which is 512 bytes, lives at the beginning of that. So we can see that the user data pointer is correct, but the process pointer is not. Now, why is that not right? Uh, I want to start dot C, create in it. Oh, this is create in it. init process ptab alloc I wonder so kernel data is going this is where all the kernel variables live is going into dram naught naught seg which is here. Yeah, that is the right address. Uh, hang on, that was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this. So this is listing all the symbols in the process. Uh, so here I can see the user base address is at E8000, while actual data starts later. Where is the process tab? Let me just run that again, because I think I may have misread it. Yeah, I misread it. This is 3FFE, this is 3FFF8. That's correct. So it is dying at 21370E. It's trying to increase the reference count of the current working directory inode.
So why is that problematic? Uh, that's here. Okay, so what is the current working directory inode? Pro should be zeroed, actually. Be much, it'd be really useful if I had a debugger. I believe that this platform does support JTAG, but I don't have a JTAG adapter. So, uh, that is an address in Flash. 4021035 385, wasn't it? 4021035 4021035 Not there. Okay, that's garbage. Why is that garbage? Well... The UData block is right. The UData block is at the beginning of our user data. It should have been initialized to zero. I, I assume it should be initialized to zero. So why hasn't it been? Because the system is because the way this is written, it's expecting U data here to be in the kernel's BSS area. Do we want to put it in the kernel's BSS area? I think we actually have the RAM to do so. It will make swapping stuff in and out more complex, but we'll actually simplify a bunch of stuff. Yeah, let's do that. So, trying to remember where that was actually set up. Uh, what does config split user data do again? In fact, it is no comp no no yeah. it is no more additional complexity for us because the code's already been written. Oh, but we have to enable config split user data. Okay, so in fact, the setup we've got here is wrong. We do need to put it in our BSS. Right, where is? U data set up. It's in tricks.s. Let's get rid of this. Uh, let's find out how the Dragon platform does it. It's defined in common mem.s. And it does need to be 512 bytes because the kernel stacks there. So we do still need this here, but we can just say common new data 512. So now if you look at the symbol table, we can see it is at A770. Uh, top of the kernel data area is at A978 and the end of our segment is at C000 so that leaves 8k free that's loads okay let's see what this does still no luck but Uh, that's a different address. Uh, 
2138CF. Interesting. This is actually crashing earlier, which is intriguing. It's trying to allocate a new process. So it's failed here. Mm. So exception 28, over here I have the manual. And try and find where the list of exceptions are. I hope 28 is in decimal. a list somewhere. I'm going to have to understand, here we go, I'm going to have to understand the exception. Huh? Okay, that, right, that's a bad address. Probably a null point of the reference. I'm going to have to understand the exception system at some point because I need to add support for those. And I believe this is the address that failed. So it's trying to load this. Uh, right, that's going to be null plus an offset of 4C, and I bet 4C is the offset of P group. So P tab here is null. But this piece of code is actually allocating the process table slot. So it find, it go, it iterates through the process table. It finds an empty slot, it zeroes it, it calculates a new PID, but it does not initialize UPTAB at this point. So where does that get set up? Dot dot C in create in it. Okay, so how does this ever work? Because if it's in, if it's setting up the up tab variable after it creates the uh after it allocates the p tab slot Does it happen in make proc here? Yes, I think it must do here. No, here. So 
So So we've got P tab alloc. Which is called from start dot C and make proc happens after all this, so it can't be make proc that's setting it up. Okay, the other place it could be happening is in platform code, so let's look for references. Yeah, it could be there. Okay. This is from machine code, so uh, that's reading it. That's only reading it, not writing to it anywhere. So this could be a kernel bug in that it shouldn't be trying to dereference this without uh, looking at it first. On most 8-bit platforms, null does not actually, dereferencing null doesn't cause a exception. So it's possible that this is just a bug that is that hasn't been fixed. So we could change the code in process.c. Process to see. No, it wasn't. It was in. It wasn't process to see. I am forgetting what I'm doing. And that was in ptab alloc as well. So this could just be no, because then it's it's dereferencing. It's doing this as well. So I believe this is creating a child process. So the child process is the in the same process group as the parent. So let's just So this feels kind of wrong to be honest, but I think that's right. Unless there's supposed to be some code somewhere which initializes this stuff in the kernel's uh, udata. But of course, the stuff that does that is right here in start.c. Yeah, I think it is actually this. Okay, so what does it do? Oh, 
Okay, that's a little better. It has uh, it has set up the it set up the init process uh, and then has failed at boot dev. I think at this point it's actually asking for a boot device. But either it doesn't, either it's hung, or else I haven't implemented uh, the TTY get char. But this is wrong for a start. So let's go back to start.scenes, figure out where that comes from. So I believe it's got to. Yeah, it's called get root dev. Right, this is where the uh, RAM size and proc mem are set up. So where does that get set? In the platform code. Yeah, there's nothing exciting here. So that's just going to be, this is kilobytes, so RAM size is always going to be 80 for us. Uh, proc mem is the user process size or is it, well, given that we have one process, I think that's going to be 64. Although things are made more complicated by the fact that we have separate banks for data and code. But I believe that these values are merely advisory. So I don't think it matters what we set them to. All right. Uh, yeah, that failed with an error. Proc mem undeclared. I think it's a scrumple. better. Okay, 80k total RAM, 64k available to processors, 15 processors max. That seems kind of okay. Right, I think we are going to have to tackle the TCY next, which is going to be exciting-ish. So, uh, we're looking for get root dev which is here um yep this is yeah the way this happens is the uh, the platform code can supply a kernel command line which contains the boot configuration. If the boot configuration isn't on that, then it prompts the user using cd read. So that is obviously where it's currently hanging. So what we want to do is to set up the command line. which appears in platform code. Uh, where 
is it actually to find? Or it calls set boot line. Yep. So what we probably want to do is Why is it calling that from inside dev MBR? Uh, dev MBR is the code that uh, handles DOS style master boot records. Uh, you give it a block device and this stuff knows how to divide it into partitions. Okay, uh, what it's doing is it's looking for a boot command line uh, on the hard drive, if there is one. And we don't have one, so what we're going to do is just call it set boot line to B. I don't actually know what this is supposed to be. Here we go. So we want to boot off uh, partition HDA2. This is the first hard drive, second partition. So that is going to be I think this is just going to be HDA2. And this will probably fail. I mean, if it works, it will fail, if that makes sense. Interesting. So what's that doing? If, oh, hang on a second. Boot device is a kernel configuration option, which we've set. I think we've set. I think what this is, is uh, Right, we can set boot device here and it will emit all this code and hard code the boot device. Uh, or it will, I don't think that's right. Or it will use the code here to try and decide whether to uh, whether to read it from some command line. Okay, so let's not do that and just do boot device 002, HDA2 that was from the prompt. That will make our code slightly smaller. Uh, still 37K. So what's this doing? Exactly the same. because we need to clean and rebuild.
Undefined reference to get root dev. That I saw that as defined right here. Here even. Or even here. So this is the code you get if you define boot device. So is this actually being compiled? Yes. I still can't find get root dev. Is this inline wrong? Yeah, the inline was wrong. Uh, C support for inline is a bit weird. That should probably be static inline. Yeah, that's better. Uh, if you just put inline on its own, then the C compiler, well, it's not really defined very well, that behavior. But clearly what's happening is the C compiler is not emitting any code for this because it's expecting it to inline it. Why it didn't inline it down here, I don't know. But let's try this and see what it does. Right, good. This is getting somewhere. Uh, it's attempted to mount the root file system and has failed because there is no root file system. Our devices are uh, defined here. So there is no file system because we haven't defined config IDE, which means our, block, our hard drive device is defined as nothing. So it tries to access it, it fails, and it panics. So we're going to have to have a file system. Now this is actually a little bit more complex than it might seem. We could put our file system on flash, on the internal flash, but for that we need a wear leveling system because the flash on this device does not have any automatic wear leveling. So we can't just put an ordinary file system on it or else we'll ruin the flash in no time because normal file systems keep writing to the same blocks over and over again and flash only has a limited lifetime. Another option is to use an SD card. I do have a SPI SD card adapter on my desk somewhere which I was planning to use for this. It should just plug in and work. The only potential issue with that is that then involves lots of fiddling around with hardware registers and wires. The other option is to use a read-only file system that's just been bodged into a char array. That would probably work, but... I don't think I want to go that route because all that work would be wasted. We'd have to implement uh, the block device functions for our fake file system. So let us just turn on config IDE. This will fail to build. Okay, we want the block dev layer, which is defined in dev. So we want to add Hasn't that built it? It 
So this should be the block device layer. Hmm, interesting. Is a optional add-on. Uh, it provides most of the work involved in doing block devices, uh, the boilerplate. So it lives in its own separate uh, library. Um, okay, we need to reference it from here. It's built as part of the platform. That should have built. Yeah, it's actually has in fact called the uh, the compiler here. There should be a block dev dot o somewhere. Oh, it's there. That's an odd place to put it. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so apparently if you don't tell it specifically where to put the object file, it puts it in the current directory rather than in the directory that belongs to the, rather than the same directory as the source file, which is odd. Anyway, we now have this uh, building. We need to add the MBR library I mentioned earlier. Is that one of those? No, it's one of these. Is it? No, it's dev. Silly me. Okay. And that actually links. I thought it wouldn't. Well, let's run that and see what happens. Okay, that's exactly as expected. Uh, we need... So it's looked up the device here uh, it's called block dev open to open it. Uh, it's tried to find it in the block device table and has failed. So we need we need to decide how we're going to do this. I think what I want to do is to actually use the SD card. Uh, because we're going to want to do that anyway. So I will need to hook it up with wires uh, and also go and find out how to actually access SD cards from a ESP8266. Um, I know it's got hardware to do this. I mean, SD cards speak SPI and the flash on this device is SPI, but I don't think we can use the same SPI interface that used for the flash for the SD card. So we may have to bit bang it through GPIO pins. But I believe there's better ways to do it than that, so I'll have to go look that up. For now, I think... Uh,
There's a big advantage of SD cards is that they're already supported here. So I think all we need to do is to put this in Turn this on. Uh, yeah, we also need this. And we need to define some symbols to actually do the low-level SD card access. Yeah, so SD drive count one. Dev SD transfer sector. is a platform thing. Yeah, this is the low-level routine to access uh, the SD card. So if we take a look at MSX2, that should be in there. You can see that it defines DevSD transfer sector in machine code. Now, I've actually done this before. So, this is the MSP430 version. This is, this is using the MSP430, ignore that comment, uh, internal routines for accessing the ASD card by its own S its own SPI interface. So you can see it's actually really simple. There's not a lot to it. Uh, all you do is set it up. That actually happens in the discard version here. So hardware initialization, then you implement one well, two functions to send and receive data, some low-level stuff. So like to, to send a byte to, oh yeah, uh, on SPI, in order to receive a byte, you have to send a byte. You clock a byte out on the bus and the slave device in response clocks bits back in again. So in order to read a byte from the slave device, the master writes a zero and uh, reads the result back that way. So we then have, yeah, well, all right, writes, a, writes OXFF. So we just wait until it's ready and then send. Uh, no, we don't. What we do is we write the byte to the output buffer. We then wait until the output buffer is empty and we return the value of the input buffer. The hardware does everything for us. Uh, right, so what am I gonna do at this point? Nothing, I think. Uh, nothing code-wise. I am actually going to therefore take a break and attempt to hook up the hardware on a sacrificial SD card. And I'll also do some reading up and look at the the Arduino code to see how it's doing SD cards because I'm sure it is. Okay, back in a bit. All right then, I've wired it up and done some reading. It turns out that the ESP8266 has two SPI interfaces called, uh, originally enough, SPI and HSPI. 
SPI is used for reading flash code, so we don't want to touch that. So the one we're going to use is HSPI. Luckily, it is completely independent. Uh, where is the piece of code? Here we go. The Arduino's got a library for talking to it. So I've wired it up uh, according to these instructions. So we have uh, the clock. We have MISO, master in, slave out. That is data from the SD card to the ESP8266. We have MOSI, master out, slave in, which is the reverse. And we have chip select. The way you work SPI is that all your SPI devices are connected to these three wires. However, the each device has its own chip select line, so you can talk to any one particular device by setting the appropriate chip select line and uh, then that device listens and the others do not. So over here I have, let's just get rid of that comment, this is a copy of the MSP430 file uh, which I've added to the uh, ESP8266 source and we're going to have to initialize things. So the first thing we're going to need to do from looking at the Arduino code which is here is we need to tell the uh, the system that the four pins that our SD card is connected to should be connected up to the HSPI device. Uh, the low-level functions for doing this are a little bit clunky. They really want you to use the uh, the Espresso client library, which of course we're not. So uh, our device is connected to these GPIOs. So that is in GPIO 13 Okay, so uh, This is just this line was just cut and pasted from existing code, so I know the format I need to find the name of the pins. They're all labeled something reasonably sensible. Okay, here we go. Uh, HSPI in default mode. Here are the SPI pins. Here are the names used by the system. So, MTDO is the chip select line. Do we have an MTDO? We do. So, MUX MTDO U gets set to something to tell it that this needs to be connected to the HSPI system. See, I was expecting to see a funk here. Hmm. I'm not a great fan of this library, to be honest. It's extremely clunky. Anyway, let's just do the next one. Uh, is MTCK and that wants to be wired up to the SPI clock uh, MTDI, no sorry, MTCK is MOSI MTDI is uh, this formatting is a bit weird MTDI is MISO And 
command mtms is clock. Uh, these are called mtcku, mtdi, u, and mtms u. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. And these pins described here are for the other SPI interface. I also believe that the SP8266 has a high-speed SD card slave interface that allows it to pretend to be an SD card. This will be presumably so you can implement STIO devices. Okay. This complicated macro here does the function setting. Hmm. Okay, well let's go look at the the Arduino code. The Arduino code's got its own way of doing things, its own library, which is rather easier to read. So that here we can see that uh, the pins used for S clock, MISO, and MOSI are being set to the special function that will hook it up to the HSPI device. Uh, the what this is all about is there's a uh, a multiplexer inside the device, which allows the various pins to be connected to different things. Uh, one option is GPIO pins, where you manually turn them on and off. Uh, the, the, there'll be other bits of hardware which can be connected to the same pins. We want to make sure that this is actually connected to the uh, HSPI device. Uh, and this bit, this stuff here is all about setting up the HSPI device itself. So let's actually just cut and paste that. Uh, doing? So I'll have to figure out how to do that using Espressif's headers. Uh, HSPI overlap mode allows you to connect a HSPI device up to the SPI pins. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to touch the SPI pins at all. Because they're being they're connected to the flash. Uh, my flash adapter does actually have a small OLED screen on it that also speaks SPI. So we could multiplex the, the SD card and the screen onto the same pins. We would end up with two chip select lines. Okay, well. Pin mode, uh, let me see what spi.h is set to. Okay, that's a global. Yeah, uh, that's not it. This is all places where it's used. This looks that doesn't look like the right one. Uh, I, honestly, I think I should be searching the. Oh, this is this is generic, so we actually want to look in here. Can I search this directory? Uh, no. Okay, well, rather than using GitHub, which is easier to read, I actually have a checked out version here. So let's just search this for pin mode. Uh, 
Uh, the Arduino library is in C++. I don't want to use C++. Here is where it's defined. This looks like code. Ouch. Yeah, this works completely differently to the uh, expressive stuff. Okay, so assuming that the pin number is below 16, if we're looking for a mode special, uh, which appears to set it to whatever hardware is connected to, then GPFFS Okay, well that's a mess. Uh, let's take another look at that library. So it should everything should be defined in here. So I bet that I just need to set it to one of these funk things. I wonder if there are some global ones. There's no references to HSBI. Uh, let me have a look to see if there's any code in here. Uh, there's a fair bit, but I'm not sure it's much use to us. There's lots of stuff about setting up SPI overlap. This looks plausible. Aha! Two, really. They didn't bother to define a symbol for it. Okay. And in fact, this is the SPI configuration stuff. Uh, this is for a slave when I'm looking for a master. Uh, so this, you see, this is setting the pins to GPIO mode. Okay, uh, this is the code for setting up the SPI device. I wonder if we could... Yeah, I don't want a link to this library because there are a lot of assumptions that we don't want, but I think we are going to want this stuff. So this is actually going to be doing, this code is going to be doing the same logic as this. Uh, so we should be able to see references to uh, the same registers to refer to up here.
Oh, here is some code for writing to an SPI device. Uh, it's all abstracted out so you can tell it which one you want, which we're not going to bother doing. Um, I believe it takes care of the chip select stuff itself. Read peripheral reg. This does look like the same sort of logic, to be honest. We wait for it to be ready. We write to the buffer. Uh, let me find read. Last byte read. There isn't one. Read. Read ESP slave. No. Interesting. Okay, well. Here in the rather badly written technical reference, there is a appendix down the bottom, if I can grab my scroll bar. Come on, there we go. With the raw uh, registers in it which should describe what they do. Yeah, the MSP 430s was easier to understand. Okay. Well, SP1C, I bet is, I bet that's clock, that's user, that's user one. Uh, C might be command, or control two. Uh, this will be a macro that will return the appropriate register for the SPI uh, number. So if I search that, no, no. I believe include driver. Right, so in fact, I suspect that there is okay. They don't define register names for the the two uh, SPI units individually, so we are actually going to have to stick with SPI one. So I want the Arduino set frequency. Function. think that's it.
Oh, that's useful. That tells us what they all are. So this is 108. 1U is... One one C, U one is one two O, U two is one two four. So here, if we look for All right, so this is SPI user. Although this is the one C matches, do I actually want So here are the two SPI units. So HSPI is one. Actually, we can. Do that. I'm very surprised there is no read here. Hmm. So this is supposed to set the SPI frequency. interesting this is common code it's not ESP specific so I'm not sure these are talking directly to registers okay I'm a little bit confused there I oh, know it is ESP code Wow that's a lot of work to set the clock that's a lot of work, which of course I'm going to have to duplicate. What's this actually doing? Um, so we've got a routine up here for calculating the frequency based on the register value, not the other way around. Clock regged freak, yeah. Oh, it's searching for a, oh, good grief. Uh, you, this is, this, all this code is there to allow you to tell it what frequency you want, and then it will search for the closest register setting. Hmm, okay, well, set clock divider is the routine that does the work. by just setting a value in clock div, which is this. So what this will be is 
some this will be a canned configuration that uh, sets the clock to a particular value but I don't know what that value is So this sets bits in a register and this clears bits in a register. So this is unsetting SPI flash mode. What does that do? Don't know. What is reg SPI base? Intriguing. So this is calculating the actual address of uh, the register. Yeah, okay, we don't actually care about that. So this is actually setting up the the SPI device. I'm going to assume that that's right. We've set the pins correctly. So the next stage is to try and read and write. I'm a little surprised that it's not doing more work to set the clock. There's no mention of clock at all. What's this? This is slave initialization. Which is not the same thing. There's a SPI read data in here. Use HSPI to read flash data for stability test. And the function name here does not match the function name here at all. Uh, this is trying to read from the code flash. No, we don't want that at all. Okay, well, let's take another look at the Arduino code. It's possible that the default will work. So this seems to be the code that will actually set the uh, the chip select line. This, this is what we need to put into this function here. So what this is doing is the it's using the user one. It's using the user one register. We've connected the user one register to the HSBI device. So this should be 
uh, set peri reg mask SPI user one HSPI two. No, that's just my plain user. Uh, so these. So that has actually set the... When we initialize things, we do set the chip select line. Interesting. So then this is going to be clear periweg mask. I not sure we actually want to set this here but it was doing it so let's stick with that so is this doing anything else no begin transaction here right this is the place where it's setting the clock And set data mode here has got to do with uh, setting the various um, SD and SBI communication modes. which I think I don't want to play with too much. Right, transfer here is the, is our transmit receive routine. Uh, what we were going to do is spin until the, the device is not busy. So I assume there's a read peri reg mask routine. Uh, we want the command register uh, we want to wait until it's not busy. Then we're going to write to our buffer and then wait again until all our data has been clocked out and then return whatever that is. These just become like so. These are common. Okay, so we now need to actually do this stuff properly. Get Perry Reg bits is the one we want. Right, this will allow us to specify the specific bits we want. So this is going to be here. Read Perry Reg bits. Whatever SPI one W naught is high low. Or we can just use read peri reg, which I actually think makes more sense here. Which I notice 
a bit further up. And that, so that will read it as a in32 and return the bottom eight bits. Okay, so this we want to loop until the busy field is set. Now, it is called SBI command. Is there a busy flag? There is not. So if I were a busy flag, what would I be called? Or I could go look for existing code. Probably SPI user, to be honest. Here we can see it doing something that looks very familiar. SPI interface, I don't recall seeing that one. This looks kind of familiar, actually. Okay, so read perireg. SPI command, SPI num, SPI user. Uh, that's just doing it the old fashioned way. Right. Set command by user. This appears to be telling it how many bits are in the command. For us, it's always going to be eight. So, set peri reg bits, SPI command, uh, sorry, SPI user to HSPI. SPI user command bit len. So this is setting certain bits of the field. Okay, I'm going to have to look up what this does. This is doing something. This looks too complicated for just sending an ordinary byte down the wire. This looks much more familiar. Right, I think that what this is doing is there's a multi-byte buffer which we need to set up. So I think this stuff here is, no, what on earth is this doing? SPI master config command. 
set command value by master mode. Well, that's no use. Um, so is this sending a command to the HSPI unit to tell it to send stuff? I don't think it is. Here's the receive command. Yeah, I wonder whether I might be better off just bit banging the interface, at least for now. I know how to do that, more or less. I was not expecting it to be quite so badly documented. In the master mode, it is the start bit of a single operation, self clear by hardware. User. This bit enable the command phase of operation. Enable the address phase. Yeah, this this is this is set up for sending entire high level commands to the device. Uh, the way SPI works is you. Uh, you tend to send complete packets worth of data. And I think that this is supposed to do a complete transaction at the same in one go, involving multiple bytes, except that's not how our code here works. If I go find dev sd.c, so like transferring a sector here, uh, we send out a command with a command byte uh, potentially multiple address bytes here we go send command uh, we send out the actual it sends out the actual command byte here we go uh, then we send the address of the sector we want to receive. Uh, we set the CRC if necessary, we send it, we uh, receive the response packet. But what we actually want to do is just send raw bytes, one at a time. So I don't think that this code here will help. I think we still need the Arduino code and then figure out how to duplicate that. Where is it? Dev SD SPC. Um, SPIW naught. I one W naught. So now that we know this much, uh, 
I think set data bit here is the one that's actually setting up the simple 8-bit transaction. Yeah, this looks familiar. Hmm. You know, I think that I should just copy the Arduino's register definitions and not use the uh, Espressives. Because honestly, I think they are easier to understand and I will let me cut and paste some of this code, which is LGPL'd. So I can't cut and paste it without affecting the license of this. Oh, oh wait, hang on. This is um, Fusix is uh, GPL, so I can use it there. Uh, I don't think I'll, I'll be using enough of it to matter. Um, my own code tends to be MIT or BSD license, so I have to think about these things. Okay. SBI one W zero is defined here. Okay, so a lot of this stuff we don't want. still want eagle sock because of these because we don't have the arduino pin mode code but we are going to include this with lots of pain let's comment this out for now that done. Transfer this turns into SPI one command and SPI busy uh, set data bits. to say that oh we want to we want to send 8 bits out and we want to read 8 bits back be 
i one w naught equals the byte command SPI busy then wait again and return the red value. All right, what's that done? We need to set the chip select line. That'd be this. SPI one U SPI UCS setup or SPI UCS hold. Whereas this is wants to be or lower wants to be and with the inverse. Okay, and that's wrong. Oh, it links. So we now actually have something executing. Now there's stuff not set right, so we still need to set the clock frequency. And we need to set, well, lots of things really. Uh, let's look for transaction. So we need to set stuff like bit order and data mode as well. But that can happen up here. Although well, now I look at it, this is actually setting up 8-bit mode. R oh, right, that is setting... I wonder if we actually need this. That is, this code here is already set up SPI 1U1, and this is setting it to exactly the same thing. Uh, user 1. So, this is where it's setting uh, mozzy bits and MISO bits, and the address bits are zero. I don't think we need this. I'm going to just comment it out rather than get rid of it. Okay, well, we do need to set the data mode. We're going to set it to uh, SPI mode three, because that's what worked for the, this is the MSP430 code, which uh, I actually commented reasonably well, which is lucky. Um, yeah, Simo and Miso versus uh, Miso and Mozzie. I rather prefer Mozzie, but the MSP430 used this. Of course these terms aren't standardized. Why would they be standardized? Ah, we're using SPI mode zero. Okay. Let's copy that just for reference.
we are using SPI mode 0. So C pole naught, C far naught. SPI 1U. Uh, we don't want, if C far is naught, we don't want SPI Yasmi, which we don't have. We don't want SPI 1P, which we don't have. Bit order. If bit order is... Uh, I think we do want most significant bit first for SD. Yes, we do. So we don't want SPI Quibo or SPI Kuribo, which we don't have. So no configuration there is needed. So that's uh, data mode and bit order sorted. We now need the clock frequency. And I think what we're going to do, that gets set here because the, the SD card code will actually set the clock to fast and slow mode in various points. I think we're just going to set it to the minimum possible frequency which luckily we have a value for. So set clock divider SPI1 clock equals right and we get rid of this Okay, well, let's try it and see what happens. Oh, right, let's go in the right directory first. And it flashes. Okay, what happened here? It failed to mount the root file system. Uh, ah, there's several things which could possibly be wrong, but one important thing is we're never calling SD raw in it, which has to happen from here to initialize the flash device, uh, to initialize the SD card layer. Uh, So that will cause the entire SBI layer to just not work. There's probably other things going on as well, but let's see what this does. Okay, that has still failed. So we want to put some tracing in. Uh, we know that's working. I'm going to put some tracing in here to see if it's ever actually getting around to calling our code, which I bet it's not. It's not. Okay, so... So up here in dev, I th I think I need to call dev sd in it to actually add the uh, sd card device to the block device table.
Uh, yes, we do. So once that's been added, SD in it. Uh, now I th think about it. Okay. No, wait, that's SCSI. I don't want to look at SCSI. They have SD in it. Right, this does not call raw in it. So let's see what this does. Okay. So... That's happening because it's repeatedly hitting line 64, which I bet is receive byte, which it is. Uh, the SD card layer is pinging the SD card, trying to get a response. And I suspect not getting one. Let's try that again without the tracing. Nope. Yeah, time out. So this is it's trying to detect the card, so that's this. Uh, this comment, by the way, saying initializing SD cards is horrible is completely true. So I'm not going to touch this code, but I do want to see what it's doing. Uh, this is this will let us see the uh, the command flow through the init sequence. So one hundred one four six SD send command which lives here has failed. SD SPI wait is supposed to wait for the command to be ready. It reads bytes and waits for a particular result. So I think it's failing to be ready. And now it thinks it is ready. Uh, okay, uh, this, I'm actually putting this tracing in the wrong place. Because the much easier way to do it, now that I actually think about it at all, is to say
So that will trace the entire uh, SPI conversation. <laughs> or at least it would if uh, this bit worked. Okay, so you can see that it is sending uh, FFs as part of the synchronization sequence. An SPI init. Right, it's sending 20 FFs because it's uh, this. What this will do is send bytes to the card to get the card up and running. Uh, receive byte, just it sends a dummy byte and returns the result, so you can see FF going out, FF coming back. Then it actually sends a command, which is this, which is this sequence here, and you can see that we're not getting anything sensible back from the SD card. So this means that our uh, library here is just wrong. So the things that could be wrong are we've got the chip select stuff backwards. I okay, let's take a look at this code, uh, this documentation. Uh, U is user, so that's this. So this is setting a setup bit and a hold bit. don't see anything called set up and hold to be honest we've got uh, that's interesting Shouldn't we be enabling the mozzie and... All right, this is user one I'm thinking about. Uh, let's say user. So there's a MISO and a mozzie bit that tell it to enable the read and write phase. So I think we need to set both of those. So we're going to use MISO. Uh, duplex there is no duplex duplex could actually be set to both of these at once uh, USSE I also don't know about okay so here are the user bits duplex is bit 1 which is not defined here. Okay, well, let's look at bits 27 and 28, which are Miso and Mozzie. Duplex, I have no idea what it is because it's not described here. Byte order is here, both ways round. SIO we don't want. What's USSE? Uh, USSE bit six uh, clock edge uh, slave mode 
doesn't matter because we're not in slave mode. So without the other phase enabled, then either the instructions are reaching the SD card but not coming back, or we're not sending anything. So what's this going to do? Nothing. Don't want that, we don't want that. So what's this? SPIMM mozzie. Phase length masks. Oh, this is user one again. Ugh. I will say that it's spending an awful lot of time waiting for anything to happen. It should be way faster than that. If I hit the reset button, if I can find it. See, it's taking most of a second to get through this bit of code. That's probably because I set it to the minimum possible clock. It's possible the SD card doesn't support that clock, and it needs to be faster. Uh, but most of the time is spent here. Right, that means it's behaving sanely. So the buffer is empty, or rather the device is not busy when we do the send, which means it prints the dot immediately. But it does take a while for this to happen, so uh, that's why we see a delay. Okay, let's go look and see how this clock works. This one. So we can set the clock to 80 megahertz by just setting a bit. Uh, given that our system clocks at 56 megahertz, I'm not sure that will work. But it's worth a try. Much faster, no difference. Let's put that back. Okay. Um, now I could have got raise and lower the wrong way around, so let's take a look at the SD card code and see how this works. Yes, it's the wrong way around. Uh, raise is. Uh, it's. Uh, the line is active low, so raised means turn it off. So that will very much explain why it's not working. I keep waiting for the build to finish, but it's really quick to build. Nothing. Try that at the fast speed again. Still nothing. And this may be too fast.
So I could use a logic probe to actually see whether any data is coming in or out. That's not really something I can do here because I have to take it to the workbench. Send and receive always transfer a single 512 byte sector, which is why this is kind of simple, a byte at a time. So what's C in C1? Well, that will be control and control 1, presumably. It was control. So set to 0. is bit order, which we want 0 to be most significant bit. None of this stuff we care about. None of that stuff we care about. Control 2. No. Okay, let's take a look at this. SPI1U, that's the user. You see, yeah, I was actually looking at this and got distracted by something else. But set up and hold are the things that are supposed to change the chip select line. Where are they? Bits 4 and 5. Not documented here. Intriguing. Now, the way we've done this is that we've connected the chip select line, which is MTDO, to GPIO 15, which is... Uh, HSPI MTIDO HPSICS. Well, this is the chip select line. Is that actually referred to anywhere other than here? I think it's not. Chrome's PDF viewer is not the greatest, but. So the other thing we can do is to set this to the GPIO value and twiddle it manually. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So let's so let's set that to func GPIO fifteen. So raising CS, setting it high, is going to be, uh, we need to set the direction as well. I've got some code somewhere for doing that. Or rather, I've got some code from someone else who, who did that. Pin dear output. So set GPIO fifteen. I should go up here. Set GPIO fifteen to output. So we can now change the state by using pin out set equals 115 pin out clear is 115 
which are not defined there. So Yeah, the, that bit of code is actually not using quite the same pin library as this is. So I'm presuming that I need to do something on the lines of GPIO reg write, but I need to know which register There are only 16 pins. Ah, uh, right, I need to do GPIO out address like so, I believe. Uh, out so I think this is a modifier that sets the bits rather than sets them this uh, that ors the underlying register with the value I gave it so that will enable that bit but while leaving the others unchanged. While for this I want to do that. Apparently there is no pindir output, so I probably want GPIO is there a direction? Okay, let's look these up. Oh, that's interesting. It seems to be that's not what I was expecting at all. What I was expecting to see is uh, is something like this. Okay, out it seems to be the actual direction. So this is going to be GPIO W1TS set pin 50, set GPIO 15 to output. These appear to be additional um, settings for the pins. So do I set the value in GPIO enable? I think I do. So that would be GPIO enable.
GPIO out W1TS. GPIO out W1TS. Address. And this is GPIO, not GPI. Well, let's see what this does. Nothing. Of course it's nothing. Fantastic. Uh, always worth swapping these around again. I very much doubt this will actually have any effect. Nothing. Could be too fast. Could be something else entirely. Yeah, I think this is need, going to need to go onto the workbench and I use the logic probe on the pins. Before doing that, let's just set this back to the ultra slow speed. Nah. Could be too slow. I'll have to actually figure out what this means and set it to something reasonable. It does feel like it is writing SPI one W zero. That's a write register. Okay, that is the register it's reading to transfer data. I thought that might be wrong and that should be R0. But you know, let's try that and see what happens. Right, there is no R0. Hmm. Do I need to set the data bits every time? Well, that hasn't helped. Yeah, this is going to need to go onto the workbench. Uh, if I could, once I've figured out whether data is being sent or received correctly, then I will know where to start looking. If data is going out and nothing's coming back, then chances are the clock's not right. It might be that the GPIO chip select line is all wrong. It might be that the mappings between the numbers written on the device and the numbers in the documentation is wrong. As I said, this is a grey market clone of an existing module, so it could be that all the data lines are just in the wrong place.
Anyway, I think I have been working on this for a while. I'm going to call it for this video. So the next one should hopefully... It might even have some workbench footage in it. Actually, no, let's not stop here, because I've just remembered a very important fact, which is I own a logic analyzer, which I've hooked up, and I've told it to record while the board is doing the thing, and this is what I saw. Now, I should be able to... Oh, these, these are the four wires, which are in order... Uh, chip select, mozzie, clock, and miso. So, this is the uh, this is the uh, the board enabling the SD card to talk to it. This is the clock. No, it's not. Sorry, this is data going out from the board to the device. And this is the clock. The device will sample the data every time the clock toggles. Now, I should be able to... Um, I don't use this very often. I should be able to tell it to decode... Uh, these four lines by a, by telling the SBI decoder. Here we go. So clock is D2. Uh, master in, slave out is D3. Mozzie is D1. Chip select is D0. So what are we seeing? Can't do much with that. Here, we can see this actually all looks kind of weird, to be honest. Uh, Oh yes, and we can also add a SD card decoder on top of uh, the SPI. Actually, we can get rid of SPI because this does it for us. So clock is D2, MISO is D3, MOSI is D1, and chip select is D0. So, what is this telling us? Uh, honestly, this is looking kind of like garbage. So, master out, slave in. This is where the actual... This is where the actual data going out to the card is supposed to be. So these are bytes. There's nothing here. So I sampled this at one megahertz and it was running at its slow clock speed. So I should have all the necessary data. The fact that this keeps turning on and off is interesting. This is the clock, so each of these I would have thought would be a byte. If 
if D0 here is chip select, that should not be going on and off at the same speed as the clock, so that seems kind of wrong. I wonder whether I actually have the lines arranged correctly. Let me just double check by looking at the device. So in order, from top to bottom, it should be chip select, mozzie, s-clock, and miso. But that does not look like anything sensible. This one here, D1, this looks like chip select. Well, we can check the pin assignment by doing this. So what this will do is it will toggle GPIO 15 indefinitely. So we should be able to go over here, run, stop, and what do we see? Nothing. So either the chip select line is wrong, or our GPIO pins are not hooked up the way we think they are. It's quite possible that they are wrong. But if I tell this to run, and how am I going to do this? Uh, this is not the most ergonomic position. You can't see any of this, which is nice for me. So, so if I touch this to each, hope you can hear me, if I touch this to each data line in turn, then eventually this is D2, this is D3, right, something on D3, D4, D5, so that's gone low, you can see in, uh, in D0, D6, D7, again a static low, D8, it's high, okay, so this suggests that D2 here, D2, D3, D3. D3 is actually the chip select line. This is GPIO 15, which is not at all what the documentation said it is. Yeah, uh, the device I've got here is supposed to be a Wemos uh, module with OLED screen. Uh, I think that the Espressi uh, ESP module itself is original, but the board is not. So I think that the data lines are just not hooked up to anything that's sensible. So let me let me have a quick look around to see if I can see any better documentation. So this appears to be roughly my module, and I can see that. Uh, D3 here is GPIO 0. Uh, now I can't remember what pin I said it was. Let me try that again. Uh, hit the run button. Right. 
Right, that's D3 on the board, which is connected to GPIO 0, which is kind of not really what I expect here. However, I do kind of notice that this is one shift at left 15, or the last bit of the 16-bit word. So if the GPIO pins are in fact labeled backwards, so that would be like this, then this might explain what I'm seeing. So let's try that. Okay, and now we go back to the logic analyzer and we search for activity again. So, uh, D8, D7, D6, D5, D4, D3, Lots of noise in D3, D2, D1, D0. So that has actually not changed the uh, what pin the noise came out on. So that suggests to me that this is not work anything like the way I think it does. Uh, hmm. Okay, let's go look at, once again, the Arduino code. Uh, so... No, nothing in there. I did actually look at this code before. Uh, I just can't remember where it is. wiring so we want output or input And you can also set uh, pull-ups and pull-downs. Yeah. So what's a GPF? I believe that this is GPIO flags. Yeah, but, well, pin function. So let's
So if we're going to use the GPIO stuff rather than the uh, expressive stuff, so we, what we want to do is to say set that bit, clear that bit. So O is output level, which seems to be correct. Uh, GPIO enable. We've also got pin control registers. So what's the difference between well, this seems to be setting the mode, which is reasonable. This is the pull up. Uh, resistor enabling, but what we actually want to do is to t figure out how to configure it to be input or output. So it's probably a GPC thing. So we see GPC. Right, that would seem to be enabling the driver. So if we say GPC fifteen equals. GPCI or GPCD. Is that going to work? Okay. Now over to the logic analyzer and see what's coming out of the pins. So let's try our old friend D3. We see stuff. D2, D1, D0, 4, 5, 6, 7, so the chip select line is supposed to be on D8, which is GPIO 15. It says GPIO 15, and it is the HCI's chip select line. Now there's various different ways of numbering and labeling the pins, so it's possible that these GPIO numbers don't match the uh, expressive documentation. But the code here also said that it should be GPIO 15, so I'm wondering if the people who made my board just hooked them up to the wrong place. I am curious to know whether I can change the pin. So I think if I were to comment these out and try and do GPF pin, GPFFS bus pin, it says, 
I wonder if these are macros, at which point we can use them, or whether they're not. Oops. That seems to have worked. Well, let's see what happens. Uh, ESP8266 GPIO2 function. is this. Uh, these are addresses in memory, so we can actually just copy this. Uh, and we don't want progmem. And, oh, We should have, oh yeah, and we want to include our peripheral library. Okay. Okay, over to our logic analyzer. And look at the pins again. Not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, well that's doing the same thing, which is good. Now let's try switching to a different pin. Uh, let's try pin 14, which should be the clock. So we flash it. Logic analyzer. We've still got stuff coming out of D3. Five, six, seven, eight, naught, one, two. Three. Okay, so that has not actually changed the pin configuration at all. So, what's the ESP doing to actually set a pin value? Digital write, set the value. Yeah, there's nothing particularly complex there. That's doing exactly what I thought it would be doing. That's what I'm doing. So why is this going out to the wrong pin? Is it configured incorrectly? Do I need a pull down? Well, it's a uh, it's an output. It shouldn't need a pull down. We might need open drain mode. Well, we've got that set. Uh, 
Although now I look at it, I do think I've got that wrong. So maybe that just needs to be like so. Okay. Let's see what this does. Well, that's pin three. That is noise. That's just me moving the probe around. Hmm. I have to say, I do not follow this at all well. I would like to know what these macros do. FFS bus. This is okay. GPFFS here set uh, returns the uh, the appropriate bits for the function. So uh, if we wanted to hook this up to the To the HSBI unit, then we would set it to probably not special. Uh, come on, where is it? Or ESP eight two six wiring digital. Then this gets set to. Ooh, interesting. I've got that set to the wrong thing. So setting it to bus actually sets it to the HSPI device. We actually want to set it to GPIO. And that should hook it up to the uh, GPIO registers. So now we might see something different. Um, it occurs to me I am doing this wrong. Uh, give me a moment. Okay, I uh, remembered that my logic analyzer has actually has eight input channels and the board has eight output. Well, nine output, but not using one of them. So I might as well just hook up all the lines and not have to fiddle with the probes. I am seeing that the noise does seem to be coming out of D4 now. Not one, two, three, four. So that could just be because I've hooked them up in the wrong place, which is easy to do. But it could be because the pin here has changed. So let's just change that to back to 15. Write it back again. And run it and see what's different. Nothing. So it appears that changing this pin and therefore changing the which line gets toggled doesn't actually 
do anything. So my feeling is that, in fact, I'm not seeing this loop toggling the line at all. What's happening is that something else is doing it. Well, that's checkable. See, I just changed it again and nothing happened. All I need to do is to comment this out. So let's write that back. And run it. Yeah. OK, so that was, in fact, a big red herring. But we are seeing that I am not, for some reason, setting the state of the output pins at all. I just don't know how it works. Let's try this. This will toggle all of the pins. And nope. So we've... What does that GPCI do? So it is set for both the output modes and the input modes. Do I need do I need that? Hang on a second. This is unsetting that field. That's just setting it to this. Uh, I don't think that did what I wanted. No, that did work. Nope. So I believe that these registers here. So GPCD, okay, pin control bits. GPCD is two. So that's one, two, four. Oh no, these are bit numbers. Not one, two. So that's enabling the driver, setting it to open drain. enabled the output enabled register is plausible GPE set is turn on that pin this different? This is now zero. Previously it wasn't. 
I just don't think it was. Ah, yes. I mean, it's not toggling, but it's now doing something. Like, what's pin 12 supposed to be? Uh, that should be pin 6. So, if this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that makes sense. But I would expect to see it toggle. which it's not. Okay, let's put this stuff in 15 and see if that changes. Hmm. Gone completely. Let's try a different one. Well, that one's toggling at a different rate. So, I think that could be our chip select line. So according to this documentation, on an ordinary module, uh, this should be pin 5. And I'm seeing that on data line 6. Let me see which actual pin that's connected to. OK, yes, that is connected to pin 6. Uh, the reason why the numbers are wrong is because I actually failed to hook up D0 here. Well, the, the line that should be there. So... If... Why did I tell it... No, hang on. Pin 6 is the clock. Yes. Wait a minute. I said pin 6, didn't I? GPIO 14, pin 6. No, pin 7. Ah, let me look again. OK, I hooked them up in what are hopefully the right order. So, these should now correspond to actual pin numbers. So we see the noise was on D3, which is correct. Uh, our new signal is on D5, which is correct. So, let's check the other ones. We want 12 should be on pin 6. Wait for that to flash. Nothing. It's gone it's gone low, but it's not strobing. Pin thirteen should be D seven. Again. Nothing, it's gone low. Chip select should be GPO 15. 15, I said.
and we're still getting this noise. So, honestly, I am very much confused. It suggests there's still something wrong. Some pins work, some don't. Now I mentioned that the that my board does have a screen attached. So it may be that I'm seeing problems because the screen is connected to some of the GPIO pins. I don't actually know how the screen is interfaced. I think it's I squared C, it's pretty slow. So what pins it's attached to? Let me go and find that bit of source code. It is in fact written on the bottom of the board. It's uh, D1 and D2. So none of these should be affected at all. So why are we seeing noise on D3? This is peculiar. Well, having done some more playing, and fiddling with the logic analyzer. I believe that something deeply peculiar is going on. So this is the board back in its its old SD writing mode trying to write to the SD card. The SD card's not actually connected, but and I can't help noticing that these here, this is the clock and it's in little bursts. I think the bursts are wrong. I think that each block here is supposed to be a clock signal. Uh, if I zoom out here, so This is uh, Mozzie, master out, slave in. So this is the board trying to send to the SD card. And this is it sending an FF. It sets this high, meaning logic one, and then it uh, toggles the clock eight times. And then it... Uh, resets everything and toggles again toggles back again looking for more data to show up and if we go along here we can see this change this is the command packet going out so if i find our dev sd uh Descend command. So it sends a command byte, which is starts out being command zero. It then sends four bytes, which are going to be zero because there's no argument. Uh, then it sends a checksum byte, and it will in this situation because we're sending command zero. So, not sure what this is, but this looks like lots of zeros to me, followed by the checksum byte. You see this lines up with this. Uh, our byte is 9.5. followed by uh, attempts to read bytes, and then it gives up. So I'm not sure why this is toggling noisily like that. Uh, actually, one thing I should try, let's crank up the sample rate. OK, 
Okay, so I need to hit run and then press reset. Uh, where is it? So that's at a much higher sample rate. So we can see this is toggling up and down at 8 megahertz. That's not right. Try that again, shall we? This time it's 16 megahertz. Uh, I need to increase this. Okay, so. Okay, so this is. Hmm. This looks very odd. This line here, D4, would be the chip select line. And uh, that's not right. And that's not right. And uh, there's no way that the decoder here can make sense of this, given that the clock is so garbled. So I wonder, is there something wrong with my SD card reader? Well, no, there can't be anything wrong with the SD card reader, because the SD card reader is not connected. So there must be something not right in the ESP itself. Probably because it's not the pins aren't configured, but that seems odd. I wonder if what we have here is noise caused by low voltage or something? I wonder if what I should do now is connect it up to an actual oscilloscope to show analog voltages. But I'm not surprised it's not working. And I have a suspicion, wrong file, I have a su suspicion that initializing all these pins is just not right in some way that I don't really know about. This has gone back to the old fashioned uh, system of letting the HSBI unit own the chip select line, even though it's not documented very well or at all. I did go hunting around for more information and mainly what I find is complaints that Espressive's documentation is terrible and missing huge amounts of stuff. Yeah, so... I don't know, really. So I am going to call it here for the day. I think there's been a quite a lot of work. And uh, I'll attempt to do some more research before tackling it again t uh, next time. And I think that next time, unless something shows up, I may have to try and use the SPI, I uh, mean, use the built-in flash as storage, which is going to be interesting, to say the least. Oh well. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.